Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, The Results of Blockchain Testing. I'm Helen King, your host for today. Blockchain is a cool new technology, but how can it be used to drive change and redefine processes? On this webinar today, we'll speak with two blockchain users on how they've used blockchain and cryptocurrency and get their use cases. <clears throat> Before I hand this over to Laura, and the rest of the panel, there are a few things I want to cover with you. We're recording today's session and we'll post it to our on-demand webinars page. You can visit our website to listen to this or any of our other webinars. Additionally, we will send out the slides at, to all attendees within 24 hours of the broadcast. We encourage you to share these slides with others in your organization and if you have questions, reach out to Laura or myself to set up a discussion. We want to hear your questions and ideas on this topic please post to the Q&A function on your um, web screen. We've left time at the end of the webinar to address your questions. Finally, we will be tweeting the webinar, so if you'd like to join on the social conversation, you can use the hashtag SCIWebinar during the event. Now let me introduce you to our host, Laura Ciceri, founder of Supply Chain Insights. As an enterprise strategist, Laura focuses on changing face of enterprise technologies. Her research is designed for the early adopter seeking first mover advantage. She comes to the stage with over 40 years of diverse supply chain experience. Welcome, Laura. Hey, thank you so much, Helen, and welcome to the audience. Today I'm speaking at the University of Tennessee uh, Supply Chain Forum, and there were about 250 supply chain leaders in the room, and I asked people to raise their hand if they were currently working on blockchain or if they knew what blockchain was. And, there weren't any hands that were raised, and so I think this is a very timely topic. We have uh, over 150 people online, and so there's a lot of interest. And, you know, we're starting into the hype cycle on blockchain where there's interest and people aren't sure just what to do with it. And at Supply Chain Insights, we try to use our research as a backdrop to drive stimulating discussion with innovators. And I look for case studies of new technologies to really showcase the use case. And today I have two innovators who have agreed to join me and present some case studies. I will start with an overview of blockchain and the work we're doing on the network of networks. And then I will move to the case studies. I will first move to the IBM case study, which is Juan Jose Rios case study. Juan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Laura. And, and thank you, Helen, for the introduction and the opportunity to share some thoughts and experiences with the audience today. Uh, so my name is Juan Ruiz. I, I work for IBM and my main responsibility is to identify and develop business applications that leverage emerging technologies. In this case, uh, blockchain. So I have uh, you know, many years of experience with uh, information uh, and technology industries, focusing at the cutting edge of uh, emerging technologies. And Juan, how long have you been working with blockchain? So with blockchain, um, um, very recently, so I, I was focused on other emerging technologies across the board, uh, but blockchain being such a new technology, um, we've been working on it for the last couple of years at IBM. Um, so again, it's, it's one of the key things with blockchain. It looks like you know everybody knows about it, but it's actually you know, a, a, a truly emerging technology. Um, so we're looking to uh, to um, kind of develop the technology as we uh, go along. Absolutely. And Cedar, thank you for joining today. Uh, I appreciate the work that you're doing at Bristol Cone. Introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your current experience with blockchain. Thank you, Laura. Um, and uh, hello, Juan. Um, my name is Siddharth. Uh, I'm part of uh, Bristol Cone. Bristol Cone is a supply chain consulting firm based in uh, uh, San Jose. And uh, I work out of our Pune, India office. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work recently with uh, blockchain and applying it to the supply chain world. Uh, and uh, glad to be here and to be able to share my uh, insights uh, with, with everyone. So thank you, Laura. You know, it's funny, Starth, when I'm in India or China, I often find that people can have a more fluent conversation about blockchain than I can in North America. Do you find that there's interest in India, uh, in Asia, in your work, or what's your perspective? Yes, I do think that blockchain overall is being discussed 
a lot in these emerging markets and that there is a uh, an ecosystem for development here. There's a lot of, lot of interest and curiosity. So a lot of work going on in, in all the various aspects uh, with, with blockchain. And why do you think that is? Do you think it's just that the supply chain is in a more formative period there, that you know we have innovation centers in India? Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, combined with the fact that we have, um, you know, the, the recent success of Bitcoin, you know, all over the all over the news as well, and so we have a whole bunch of these, uh, you know, uh, centers of innovation that are really trying to look, you know, uh, get to the root of that success, and that's where blockchain is really starting to come into the to this, the center here, center stage. So it's a little bit of both, definitely. And uh, you're right, there's a lot of interest uh, and hype around around that space right now. Yeah, because I found it interesting in today's session that no one raised their hand, but if I go to India, I would have a lot of hands raised. And I don't know if it's like, you know, in Africa where we bypass the phone plugging into the wall, whereas in, you know, more of the established countries, we have less experimentation. But let's start and describe what blockchain is, and then let's go into the use cases. Thank you very much for joining us. and. What we're doing today is uh, to talk about the confluence of technology. So at Supply Chain Insights, we're looking at how can we take the new technologies, whether it's blockchain or streaming data or robotics or wearables or cognitive computing and open source analytics, and transform the atoms and electrons of the supply chain we agree, I think, at a fundamental value level that we should be building value chains. We haven't necessarily defined what value is, and we're not clear on the capabilities of these new technologies as individual technologies or as a confluence of new technologies. But we know that there's a lot of potential and a lot of opportunity to change, and that what we have today is just really not able to connect us business to business. So what is blockchain? It's an immutable digital ledger of transactions, of economic value that can be pro programmed to record anything of value. Now, immutable is good and bad. It's uh, good in that it can't be changed. It's bad in that it can't be changed. So we have to be careful what we write onto a blockchain and while blockchain is secure, the software on blockchain may not be. And there are many variants of blockchain. Today we're going to talk about the Hyperledger project, which is an open source option. And there's software term Fabric, which sits on top of Hyperledger and enabling the passage of contracts and documents. And so when the case studies are presented and people talk about Hyperledger or they talk about Fabric, these are the definitions, and then uh, there also may be some definition of channels, which is a way that we can actually work with blockchain to define a channel. Now, in my blog, Supply Chain Shaman, I wrote a blog on the use cases for blockchain, and in the network of networks work, we're working on community registry. So we're looking at, could we have a data oracle that could provide information about suppliers that would allow us to access the data once and write on to many value networks? In that work, we found that there are security issues with some of the blockchain options, which do not necessarily allow the writing of the data many-to-many. -many. And most of the blockchain case studies are more one-to-many. So the case studies we're going to talk about today are one to many. So the evolution of many to many architectures is even newer than the evolution of one to many flows. The other thing we're looking at on the network and networks work is could we replace EDI through blockchain types of enablement? And uh, we're a long ways away from that, but you know it is a possibility. Uh, lineage and track and trace is more mature, and we actually have a lineage case study today we'll talk about. And lineage allows track and trace across multiple parties to enable visibility of where did things come from, what was the origin, and, and what hands did goods and services pass through. And then safe and secure supply chains, which we also have a case study of this today, is 
are the goods safe in terms of cold chain or what happens in handling and are they secure and should we be able to use the goods you know today we discard about a third of perishable items and so as we look at uh, the food supply chain and the ability to feed the world in 2050 the ability to have reliable cold chains and be able to have safe and secure supply chains increases the other thing is how about social responsibility you know whether we're talking about gold or diamonds or you know Congo metals the ability to have the tracking of social responsibility to be able to ensure that we've met fair labor policies or that we've met the issues around where did goods come from against social responsibility goals and one of my favorite use cases is redefining supply chain finance it bothers me as a small business owner that the biggest building in each town is a bank and the banks have their hands in our pockets with every supply chain transaction we're currently doing some research on supply chain finance of could we use an alternate form of currency which could flow through the blockchain multi-tier processes to be able to do payments on receipt or payments uh, against uh, agreed documents and contracts. When I was recently in Colombia and I had a fascinating discussion with uh, the United Nations representative about feeding children on the Colombian Venezuelan border, today it takes 30 days for money to translate from one currency to another in the Colombian banks and there are issues in terms of paying the farmers so one of the things that I did out of that conversation was I introduced her to a couple of blockchain companies to see if we could work on supply chain finance redefinition in Colombia to feed children to disintermediate banking and take the funds that are available directly from the agency to the farmers and to improve supply chain finance. It's work that's going on, not sure where it'll end up, but it is demonstrative of the use case. And then just in general document sharing, you know, we have, you know, a lot of contracts, a lot of legal documents that never make it into the supply chain in a secure way. So these are some use cases, you know, you can't talk about blockchain without talking about cryptocurrency Bitcoin is you know making a lot of headline news right now and you know alternate forms of currency are very promising and we have a lot of work that's going on in banking and you know I was talking to a couple of credit card agencies MasterCard and Visa the other day about rethinking about use of cryptocurrency in this evolution now we have a small group of business leaders and uh, technologists and uh, Bristol Cone and IBM are both part of this group and we're working on some use cases on many to many networks around community directory, traceability, supply chain finance and interoperability. And as we get into this and we start to do the testing and we find out that you know, the technology is very new, uh, our work here is very early. And so today, what I'm not going to do is present many to many case studies, but what I've asked Bristol Cohn and IBM to do is present one to many because the old world view that we were going to pipe or hardwire the supply chain through ERP, my ERP to your ERP to their ERP is just a false assumption. You know, the world's about a lot more than transactions, it's about structured and unstructured data requires the flow of data multi-tiered on many parties simultaneously and what I want you to do is to look at the case studies and think hard about what is visibility today we have automated visibility within the manufacturing world of a company and this is from research we've done blue is what companies see as important green is current performance and you can see manufacturing within a company is fairly well aligned an inner enterprise management of orders, contracts, huge gaps. Management of first tier material suppliers, large gaps. Management of transportation logistics providers, large gaps. The management of all three of these together, even larger gaps. And so as we think about the fact that the supply chain has many parties that need to interoperate simultaneously and that we need to redefine visibility 
we enter into the world of blockchain. And in the area of supply chain for companies that rate themselves the highest and supply chains working well, there are five factors that have correlation, one of which is supply chain visibility. So rethinking visibility, rethinking multi-tier flows, I think is extremely important to not only the supply chain working well, but also into really improving price to tangible book. One of the things that we do at Supply Chain Insights is we look at the correlations between people that have more mature practices and the impact on financials. And while this does not reflect the deployment of blockchain, we do see that companies that have better second and third tier supplier visibility do have some low correlation to price to tangible book. So I think that the business case for blockchain to be able to have safe and secure, to be able to mitigate risk, to be able to do multi-tier communication is really exciting. So with that, I'm going to switch to the IBM case study, and if you tell me when to change the slides, I'll be glad to change them. Let's share this insight. Great. Um, so thank you so much. Um, hello, hello everyone again, and uh, thank you all for joining. Um, and thank you so much for, for that very clear and succinct explanation of what blockchain is. Um, it's, it's, it's never easy to explain this, uh, these technology concepts, and, and um, I think that was a very clear explanation. So hopefully, you know, the audience is, is clear with um, with what the technology is and, and, and why it has the potential to disrupt your industry. Um, so I want to spend a lot of time explaining the difference between the diverse blockchain networks out there, uh, but rather focus on this one um, solution uh, where Merckx and IBM are collaborating to reduce global trade barriers and increase efficiency in international supply chains. We call this global trade digitization. So this is just a, a placeholder uh, name for now. Um, and um, just, just to step back for a second and, and explain, um, you know, and before I explain, you know, what is that we're doing and, and, and where we're in the journey, I, I would like to talk a, li a little bit about how it all started. Um, so when our team at IBM is exploring opportunities in the industries that we serve, we always start by identifying key industry problems and, and building a thorough understanding of the existing challenges. And then we openly discuss if blockchain is the best technology available to address them. Because in some cases, there are other technologies that are sufficient and more effectively address uh, those issues. So I wanted to clarify that point. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Great. So with global trade, uh, the industry that uh, you know we're discussing today, uh, we undertook substantial research and came to realize that despite progress in the last few decades around data visibility, process optimization, and demand management, we still have many inefficiencies across the ecosystem. Uh, that are hampering growth. Uh, so for instance, on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a pie chart that shows how the cost of shipping goods is split among the main cost categories in percentages. So those numbers are percentage here. And well, on average, we can see that the admin cost of shipping a product uh, more than doubles the actual cost of the transportation of the goods, right? So that's the 20% versus the 8% on the pie chart on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, uh, these are results from a World Economic Forum study where they compare the impact of either removing tariffs altogether or reducing those administrative trade barriers and conclude that even in their more modest scenario, the one in the middle, having countries operate as efficiently as their regional partners will increase global GDP by 2.6%. And global trade by 9.4%, uh, uh, sorry. This is a total of $2.5 trillion annually. So these figures are big. Uh, but how realistic it is that, you know, to get the ecosystem to embrace this so-called best practice. So we tested our hypothesis with a proof of concept. Um, and we started with that. Um, so go to the next slide, please. So what, we tracked several shipments very closely, and the one showed on this slide was the shipment of one avocado from Kenya to the Netherlands. Uh, and we had a PhD student literally traveling along with the avocado from the farm to the final destination. And 
that story that has its own uh, webcast. Um, it's, it's it's very interesting when 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 he explains you know all the different things that uh, he went through. But but to to sum up the uh, the the uh, the journey, uh, that relatively simple shipment of one avocado, um, you know, had about a hundred people involved in the shipment from thirty different organizations that were exchanging a total of about two hundred documents. Um, so that gives us a sense of you know how the current supply chain works, and and with the proof of concept blockchain solution that we build to compare the uh, that scenario with the with the, with the hopefully future scenario, you know we assess that many of those steps can be simply eliminated. Um, um, so after you know testing that initial proof of concept and, and looking how it will help a specific shipment, um, uh, then MERS and IBM decided to invest on, on building what we call the global trade digitization solution. And the next slide shows how it works. So on the left-hand side, we have the current process. And on the right-hand side, we have the new process. Today, we have many point-to-point -point information exchanges, which are not only very costly to maintain, so Laura mentioned earlier, you know, the EDI protocols and, and how expensive it is to, to maintain those IT systems that have those EDI point to point um, um, information exchanges. They also create a lot of friction as every party keeps critical information in their organizational silos. In the UTD solution, on the right-hand side, all parties are connected to that single network of interconnected systems. Uh, that speak the same language, and more importantly, ensure that the information is secure, trusted, and immutable. The main attributes of a blockchain for business. So on this permission blockchain, participants um, that are identified and authenticated, to clarify this is a permission blockchain or a public blockchain like the Ethereum or Bitcoin, uh, those participants are identified and authenticated and then can securely exchange information uh, thanks to a um, uh, sophisticated permissioning system. Uh, so in essence, the relevant parties have one version of the truth, uh, and it's that version of the truth is available to them in real time. And, and that's really the key value add of, of blockchain. Um, it allows participants that not necessarily trust each other to transact in a secure and trusted environment without the need for that central intermediary. And the result is a more efficient ecosystem that traces all votes. So by being able to share that information, everybody benefits from it. And, and that's why we believe the global digitization solution in a way will be a, a, a commodity tool that everybody could use and benefit from. Um, oh, sorry, can you go before? Slide before, next one. Yeah, perfect. Um, so let's look at the key components of the, uh, the GT solution. Those, those components are two. Um, we call one the shipping information pipeline and the paperless trade. So the shipping information pipeline is the part of the solution that enables ecosystem participants to securely and seamlessly exchange shipment events. So this is about the events. Um, and we start at the container, container level, which means all the events exchanged in the shipping information pipeline are following that container from the moment the empty container is picked up to so export, ocean, import, uh, to the, the moment that the empty container is returned. So in essence, it's a publish subscribe mechanism. So like Laura mentioned, not point to point, but many to many. Uh, the paperless trade uh, capability focuses on the documentation side of the transport. It allows participants to specify document workflows for each origin destination pair and product code. So we use harmonized schedule codes uh, to reduce manual processes, paperwork, and more efficiently secure um, secure and more efficiently and securely file um, with custom authority. So, and, and again, we want this to be an industry platform. This is not just a, an IBM solution that is you know, Merck is using or a solution that Merck uh, is having. And this is just IBM and Merck uh, collaborating to bring this industry solution that hopefully everybody can use and benefit from. And so we thought very hard about making sure that every participant benefits from this solution, right? So we have those on the right-hand side of the slide. So ocean carriers, so not just merits, all ocean carriers can benefit from this solution. Um, then uh, trade associations, authorities, foreign terminals, freight forwarders, uh, et cetera. So there is a clear value proposition for each one. 
And in this uh, summary slide, I just wanted to provide an overview of where we are. So we started our beta program a couple of months ago, and we're currently testing and getting feedback from all beta participants. Uh, and our plan is to have a, a production version next year. Um, but it's very important uh, for us to to get feedback from the from the from all of you guys, right? To make sure that we have the right solution um, for the industry. Um, so just to sum up, so blockchains again, it changes the game. There are many solutions out there, but it looks like it's the right technology at the right time to uh, to solve for the problem of uh, unwillingness to share data more broadly. Again, we are designed as an industry platform, um, so the end-to-end -end supply chain uh, will be involved. Uh, and again, the ecosystem will say will shape the solution. So we're taking our time to build the right capability and talking to uh, all the beta participants on what is that they need from the solution and building that into the solution itself. We're moving fast. I mean, we're decades all organizations, but we're moving fast not just using agile methodology, but also getting the ecosystem participants on board. And again, it's big companies with big names, but you know, both organizations are committed uh, to to make this happen and there is executive commitment and, and big investments behind this initiative. Um, so I think that's the time that I have um, for that. Um, but thank you. I think we really for listening and looking forward to your questions. So we have a couple of questions if you don't mind. One question from the audience is in the blockchain are you sharing personal information like uh, the grower information um, or supplier contact details? Um, and if so, can you talk about security of that information? Yeah, thank you for that question. And it's a question that we get from every participant that we have conversations. It's a very, very important question. And just, not just in terms of existing data privacy, but also looking at you know some of the European regulations that are coming on. Um, and, and in a way, it's, it, it's not, so what, when we think about this, it's not really a blockchain issue, it's really a, you know, like software as a service issue that, you know, where information resides in the cloud and how do you solve and secure uh, that information. Uh, so what, what this solution is doing is, is making sure that the data is always owned by the uh, customer in this case, right? And only the customer dictates who has access to that information. And that's one of the things that, you know, um, Hyperledger Fabric 1.0 enables, right? That, that very funular level of permissioning um, uh, to make sure that only the information that you want others uh, to have are being shared. Um, and, and, and again, in that, this just follows the data privacy protocols that any other participants would have, right? So, so if, if you want to share the name of your company uh, with those participants, so that name uh, will be shared, but it's up to, to the organization to decide what's being shared with whom. Okay, Andrew has a question, Juan. He wants to know, is there a book or like a primer on blockchain and Hyperledger product project that he could read? Uh, do you have one at IBM? Yeah, so we actually have an um, IBM blockchain uh, for dummies uh, book. It's, it's very thin. It's only in 60 pages long. Uh, but um, yeah, and one of our colleagues on, on our research uh, and development organization wrote it. Uh, so I probably will start with that one. Um, probably you, I, I can send the link, but if you Google it, I'm sure you'll, you'll find it. Um, you know, Blockchain for Dummies um, by an IBM fellow. And I think we're all dummies in this case. So let's go on to our next use case and then keep the questions coming. And we will come back. And this is a use case around safe and secure and real-time cold chain visibility from India. So can you share what Bristol Cone did here? Sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so as Laura was saying, uh, uh, this is a use case where we're talking about food safety. And uh, it, this is primarily based around the use case in India. But I know that this also has implications in the US with the, new, the, the FISMA regulations coming around uh, with the food safety modernization. So um, the genesis of this whole sol the use case or solution is uh, being able to track the environmental conditions of uh, sensitive goods. And so uh, this specific use case is about milk because uh, uh, in India specifically, uh, you know, 20 to 50% of the total produce can go waste by the time it reaches uh, the end consumer uh, in, in the case of milk, uh, which is a huge, huge, huge amount. Um, and, and this use case comes from a, a very large dairy uh, a dairy service provider or dairy manufacturer in uh, northern India. 
and uh, 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 essentially what's going on is that a lot of milk uh, you know goes waste and then it's hard to hold any one party accountable for that loss and there's a huge amount of loss so we're looking to leverage uh, and, and and one other thing I wanted to mention is uh, going back to Laura's first slide is that this is a confluence of technologies so blockchain plays a role here but it's Primarily around uh, you know informa information of everything sensors IOE sensors that are on trucks and then um, you know uh, data from there then gets onto this blockchain um, and then we have other systems that integrate as well. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, right? So uh, just a bit more information around uh, the uh, the case for cold chain visibility. We're, we're talking about sustainability with less loss. We're talking about social responsibility, um, uh, and uh, the, the, at the bottom you see the different components of, of the solution, which is real-time track and trace, uh, which happens through the sensors. You have secured information sharing through blockchain. Uh, we create intelligence from the raw data for analytics, and then you have humorized interaction uh, through various next-generation uh, uh, communication products. So if you go to, quickly go to the next slide as well. So this is a, uh, a quick demonstration of the use case. If you have a, a child in, in, in one side and a farmer in the other side, uh, you can see the chain that gets that sort of goes out with you know the different trucks from a different from a single distribution center. Uh, and if you keep clicking, Laura, you'll see that if a certain violation happens at, along the way, you should be able to in real time detect that and then route, reroute and you know respond to that contingency within your supply chain uh, in real time uh, while being able to hold any one party uh, accountable. Uh, about for, for that for the loss that happens uh, and for the delays um, and so if you could uh, go to the next slide we can sort of see a preview of of uh, of, of, of the solution um, and so uh, the solution has four pieces uh, the way it's divided up and I'm going to walk you through the entire solution uh, piece by piece and show you the different features that, that are sort of enabled to the solution um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the first piece is, is around tracking, and this is a sort of a dashboard that would sort of take you to each of the individual uh, uh, places in the app. But the first, the first part is around tracking the actual location and, uh, of your actual assets. Uh, the second part is around seeing violations. So violations would be when certain uh, parameters are, are, or certain threshold are, uh, thresholds are crossed, in this case primarily temperature. Um, and then also analytics around how much uh, uh, you know the kind of losses or gains or, or violations happening throughout uh, your fleet um, and then also I think we may have lost you um, so this is a case study where we can see the active number of assets the violations and the notifications which allows people to Look at and take you know, this product. There you I'm go. Sorry. There okay. you go. You're back. Great. So uh, did I cut yeah. out? Yeah, you did cut out. So let's go back then. Um, so we're actually moving the truck and seeing the violations, right? Yep. That's. Uh, um, yeah, that, that's where we are. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry about uh, my connection here. I don't have the best okay. uh, connection. It's wonderful that you can join us from India, and I know it's late at night, so thank you for doing that. Um, Absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm really glad I could be here. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful attendance as well, so I'm, I'm really glad I could have uh, to, to be here. Um, and sorry about again about the, uh, the connection issues. So what I was saying was, uh, um, it's the distributed consensus that is really, really interesting to me in blockchain, and that's sort of the main thing, the main property we're trying to leverage here. Apart from, of course, the immutability and uh, uh, you know the, the flexibility it provides in, in terms of transparency, but that within blockchain comes in one of the core aspects is is consensus, uh, uh, consensus on what the latest copy of the data is, and uh, each of the each of the different suppliers or each of the different uh, stakeholders here. Would be nodes in a blockchain that would get to sort of have uh, uh, some some say in what the latest copy of the data is, some stake for say, for for example. And uh, without going into too much detail around proof of stake and proof of work, uh, it's just that the traditional notion of blockchain is was almost always tried, tied to cryptocurrencies, 
And so we think about miners, you know, mining a whole, you know, doing a whole lot of Bitcoin mining and earning a whole lot of currencies. But in our case, the kind of blockchain we're talking about here in the enterprise is going to be largely around proof of stake, where we have, where we we're just trying to go for that consensus through uh, some sort of voting. Uh, and that's what's sort of happening here is we're tying all of all of the stakeholders onto a blockchain, and then everyone has access to the same data, you know, uh, and 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 we can sort of say that everyone agrees to the, to the latest copy of the data. And one interesting thing that that enables is smart contracts, because you can now write logic that will execute in real time because you have consensus on the data, and you can sort of you know uh, execute logic that sort of complements it in in real time. And uh, <clears throat> rather than have a dispute process that happens, you know, in sort of in a batch process afterwards, after the fact, you can have, since everything's happening in real time, you can have smart contracts. And, uh, and a demo of that is going to be there on the next slide after this one. What we're doing is we're executing a penalty clause each time a certain number of violations happens. So in, in this case, after 10 violations, uh, there's a certain penalty violation uh, amount that gets deducted in real time from your ERP system. And uh, so that's that's uh, speeding things up definitely in terms of uh, settling disputes and uh, you know having real time uh, execution of logic and you can have smart contracts that do all kinds of different things by leveraging this this property of of, of distributed consensus um, and so this little front end is trying to it's, it's our attempt at visualizing what is largely invisible in a blockchain because it's, it's it's essentially a database of sorts and there isn't much you're going to see. But what, what's going on in this little uh, control panel uh, is that you see little blocks come in at the bottom because the blockchain essentially is a chain of blocks. Um, and you can see red ones that, that, are, that are violations. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And the whole page is actually uh, showing, you know, status of each uh, asset, you know, with, with its location, its violations, you know. And on the right side, you see uh, a summary of violations going happening. And so, it, you can imagine it as uh, uh, you know smart contracts along with track and, uh, along with physical sensors uh, on these devices, and then putting all of that data onto a blockchain, and then executing logic in real time uh, uh, on top of all of this. This is sort of this is this is this is uh, uh, this is the the setup um, that we have. Uh, if you could go to the next slide from here, you could also see that uh, as a as a uh, as an add-on, we can have uh, analytics, and you can you can you can analyze all of this data because we generate a lot of data through all of this, and we could see things like you know which shippers have the least violations for the most amount of uh, 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 cargo shipped, and you know see see you can you can sort of start rating your suppliers and and use this uh, in various ways and use the information intelligently. Uh, and I think I think that's about the, that's about it for for that that use case. I hope that was not. Um, I, I, this comes from the perspective of someone who's uh, uh, been implementing it, and so most of it might have been technical, but uh, that's about it. And I would love to have any questions. I think it was a great use case. Thank you very much for sharing. What have you learned about blockchain? I mean, we don't collaborate very well in the extended supply chain. We talk about collaboration, but we don't really collaborate. And node agreement. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned about that? I mean, this is a use case where people are pretty aligned on getting milk to children, uh, so it's simpler mm -hmm. than some. Yeah. What have you learned about data validation, collaboration at a node level uh, that you can share? Yeah, so I think this this really goes down to the core of, of what's um, uh, why why blockchain hasn't really taken off all of a sudden in the enterprise world, and uh, it's it's one of them is is again uh, uh, this case was yes easy because everyone's aligned but yeah a lot of times people aren't always aligned uh, the transparency and visibility that's coming through is not always desired from all parties and uh, a lot of times you know it's it's counterintuitive at least to me but a lot of times when I suggest this to to potential clients. Uh, we see a lukewarm response simply because it seems like putting that out there would make them also vulnerable. For example, in this case, fal faults would, could you know be identified uh, from either side. And so, uh, I think there's a sense of fear that comes with sort of the new, new technology and then sort of the consequence of that. And a lot of firms might be uh, might resist that that initial risk. Uh, that that's sort of my perception. Yeah, in supply chain we have carrots or incentives and we have sticks and I think we've 
operated with more sticks than carrots. And uh, the mm -hmm. brand owners who have power have wielded power. And so blockchain is sort of an equalizer at a node level for collaboration of data. What's IBM's perspective on this around the definition of a node and validation of data? Yeah, another great question. Um, yeah, so uh, by the way, we're getting this, also the same the same impact from from participants, big and small. Uh, you know, they all uh, you know are of the opinion that this data is kind of a key competitive differentiator. Um, and I guess the, the argument that we're trying to make is like it's actually not. I think there are other kind of added value services that can be built on that commonality of data that can be shared. So again. Uh, help everybody else. And usually, because I come from financial services, I use a financial services comparison. Right? There are many kind of um, uh, consortia, industry consortia, and financial services that all the banks got together and decided, look, this is not really a key differentiator for for us. It's you know consuming a lot of resources and time and effort, and we only do the same, and we're not going to differentiate by having a better kind of underlying uh, data system, right, or things like the Swift. Um, Consortium and the Swift protocol to to change money, right? So 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 we believe, uh, yeah, yeah, there is that, that level of commonality where everybody would benefit, and then the idea is to to build, you know, other value services and differentiating um, value propositions on top of those services. But but yeah, it's so something that we we acknowledge, and and it's you know it's it's probably we're talking about blockchain implementations. The technology is complex and and it's it's continuously evolving. The, the, the biggest conversations around the governance, right? Okay, so we're going to have these smart contracts. who are going to be able to automate some of the current processes, but who decides, you know, what those smart, smart contracts do, right? So there is a lot, uh, you know, a, a thick layer on governance uh, that we're building uh, as part of this solution and um, as part of any really blockchain solution that has, you know, ecosystem participants involved, and, and that's where we're spending a lot of time thinking about what is the right governance. Uh, business governance on top of the uh, blockchain technology. Which I think is a really good point, whereas I think the blockchain deployments have greater success when there's a clear definition of what good looks like. Like, we know if milk is held at certain conditions, it's going to spoil. Or we know if goods come from certain characteristics of countries that they have a higher likelihood of being Congo metals where we have clarity around what good looks like, I think blockchain is easier. Where we haven't shared data before, like demand data, right? We don't have a clue how to share demand data um, or what good looks like. Then it becomes really problematic. And I also see a question here around the definition of immutable. You know, one participant says, well, if the data is wrong in the blockchain, can I just change it? Um, and that gets to the whole definition of immutable. What are your thoughts there in terms of your experience around clean data on blockchain and data governance? Yeah, so, um, I, I, sorry, if you don't mind, I'll go first, because that reminds me of an analogy oh, that, that my boss actually uses. My boss yeah. uses, right? She, she says, you know, in a way, think about doing a crossword puzzle. And think about doing a crossword puzzle with a pen as opposed to a pencil, right? You, you may go back and, and change something, but there is an audit trail. So everybody's going to be able to see that you changed something. But when we're saying it's immutable, it means what was written cannot be tampered uh, with, cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, modified. But you definitely can have a transaction that afterwards that kind of reverses the transaction that was recorded before. So when we're saying it's immutable, you have that auditability, but obviously there was a wrong transaction and you can execute another transaction that kind of uh, reverses uh, that action. Um, so hopefully that, that clarifies the immutability uh, concept of every blockchain network. I think that's a wonderful gift. I love the analogy. Um, it's a great analogy. Um, how about at Bristol Cone? Any comments here around immutability or you know, changing data? Yes. So one thing I wanted to say was uh, the very nature of a blockchain is such that if anything was changed in the past, the entire chain gets invalidated. Uh, and the, the, the whole point of the chain is that all the data in a block gets hashed, and then there's a chain between this hash and the next hash. And the idea is that if you have a very long chain, 
if and when you say immutable, it says that if you changed even one bit in the entire chain somewhere really far back, all the hashes would certainly change. And then so the entire chain gets invalidated. So immutability is built into the very nature of, of how the blockchain is designed. So, so, so people really need to understand what immutable means before they get started. I, I think so. I think this would be a, a one way of looking at it. Yeah. So, you know, if you step back and people don't know much about blockchain in general, what recommendation would you have? Where could they get started? Where could they have the best success? I see, you know, more deployments where we've got a well-defined outcome. We've got a multiple party business problem that needs to be solved. We've got already exchange of the data. Uh, one to many, not many to many. Uh, how about at IBM? What recommendation would you give to people to get started? Yeah, so again, being one of the organizations that really, you know, invested early on in this technology, we, we realized that these concepts are easy to grasp. Um, it's, it's initially not easy to see, you know, what is the real business application. So that's why we set up this um, blockchain garage. Uh, so we have blockchain garages, I don't remember right now on the top of my head, but in kind of every kind of major uh, city globally. And basically those garages are, you know, open to to every uh, everybody, right? So, um, you know, we ask people to to engage with us and, 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 you know, we don't charge anything for, you know, the first conversation and to really help them to, you know, how this technology can help solve some of the key um, problems and challenges. Uh, but but there is also a lot of documentation on the web. But basically, there are, there are three main components that we we say, right? So first of all, it has to be um, something that involves different parties, right? So if it's just your own organization dealing with internal stakeholders, maybe that's not really the best <laughs> use case, right? Because it's about you know participants that really don't trust or or or, or know each other, right? That, that's the use case that helps. So again, it has to be a network of different entities. It has to be something that it cannot be solved easily by a normal distributed database. So we had distributed databases already for many years, right? But somewhere where that concept of immutability, um, you know, is key uh, to the success or, or to be able to solve that that key uh, problem. And 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 the third thing that we recommend is to start with a very niche use case, right? So on our example was that shipment of that one avocado, right? So start with a very well defined and simple use case and, and, and try to think about the as is and the to be process and how how you know this technology could help transform those processes. Well great. Um, we probably have, I don't know, fifty questions and what I'd like to do is answer all the questions on my blog and I'm wondering if I send them to you, Juan, if you'll help me answer them uh, for the blog. Uh, there's a lot of interest, uh, but I appreciate your perspective uh, on that. Let me shift to Bristol Cone. What would be your recommendation for people to get started? Um, sure. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say is uh, uh, to get an idea, the very basic idea of a blockchain, before we before we dive into uh, you know more formal sources. Uh, one good idea is to go through this one demo I really really like. It's, if you just go to Google and search blockchain demo, it's the very first link that shows up. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's one on Anders.com. Um, and, and what he's done is he's visualized the chain in a very simple way. And uh, I, would, I would suggest people to go look at it because it explains you know, visually the entire concept and it starts to make a lot of sense. Another thing I would say is uh, to read the, very, the, the, the papers published by Satoshi Nakamoto, which was the, uh, the, 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 the creator of blockchain. Uh, and, and so, so he or she or whoever it was, because I'm not sure we know who it, who, who it was for sure, uh, published you know very in, in, in very you know crisp and clear um, you know language exactly what you know they envisioned blockchain to be, and you could see there was a very clear purpose that they were sort of going after. Uh, but it's I think it's one great place to sort of look at that and look at sort of the the mind of the person who sort of you know, triggered all of this. Um, but I would say at least two things for sure, and then. Uh, all the stuff uh, uh, Juan just said. Well, thank you so much. So we'll run the questions on the blog uh, to be sure we get all the questions answered. And we'll also give you any other uh, great resources. I love the URL uh, insights that you gave and blockchain for dummies. 
I think one of the things that blockchain does is it makes you step back and think about business to business differently. Business to business that allows people to work on a common architecture that is immutable and the data basically is shared amongst the parties and it is done via nodes and a different level of agreement. It allows the redefinition of multi-tier processes. It's you know, an opportunity that we haven't had before that gives us great promise. At the same time, I think we've got to be very careful to manage the hype cycle of blockchain and that it is very new and our ability to understand it and deploy it is emerging. And so when I read a lot about how it's the answer for all the supply chain problems, I just kind of laugh because we're still very much in an experiential mode of testing. It should only be deployed in one-to-many or one-to-one -one kind of conditions where there is a good definition of governance. This is part of our supply chain webinar series to help people to understand emerging technologies. We will continue this series and a countdown for our summit for next year, which will be in September in Philadelphia, which will have a blockchain track, a Internet of Things track, and a cognitive computing track on the first day of our conference to help people to understand the practical use cases of innovators on the individual technologies. On the second day, we'll be talking about the coalescence of technologies to redefine supply chains, to drive a revolution, and to build a guiding coalition to build change and rethink processes outside in that look quite different than they do today. Our data says that 90% of supply chains are stuck, and we don't believe they have to be. We think by redefining the atoms and electrons of the supply chain, we can start to build new capabilities. And we want to provide first mover advantage for innovators. So we encourage you to read our research, which is independent at Supply Chain Insights. We have a monthly newsletter, which will go out this week. Uh, it's monthly, and on the Supply Chain Shaman, which reaches 15,000 people, our Beat Fusion community, which allows dialogue and sharing and blogs from third parties, and also the ability to share jobs, and then uh, the LinkedIn postings that we do, and our continued webinar series to help supply chain leaders. And mark your calendars now for the Supply Chain Insights Global Summit, which is really designed on how to think differently and drive new outcomes. Thank you for joining us today. With that, Helen, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thanks, Laura, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. A few things to share before we end. As I mentioned, we will send out the slides and the recording link to everyone on this webinar, so keep an eye out for a follow-up email. We also encourage you to engage with us on social media by following us on Twitter, Facebook, and joining our LinkedIn company page. You can find this information on the slide deck. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.